set of videos are going to show you how to answer the questions for the new reform maths functional skills exams uh, for level two. These are the exams starting from September 2019. And we're going to start with an on calculator paper. So hopefully you've got a copy of the paper in front of you. I've got my question up here. Uh, question one, Rhea works in a paint shop. She needs to make 1,500 millilitres of purple paint. Rhea makes purple paint by mixing red paint and blue paint and white paint in the ratio of 3 to 2 to 1. How much blue paint does Rhea need to make 1,500 millilitres of purple paint? Okay, quite a lot there, so I'm going to write the key things up on the board for us in the form of a table. So, uh, we've got a ratio and we're told that we have red paint, blue paint, and white paint, and that the ratio is 3 to 2 to 1. And when they mix that together, they make purple paint. And I'm going to think of that as my total. So if we had three litres of red paint, two litres of blue paint and one litre of white paint, well, that would make six litres of purple paint. Three plus two plus one is six. Okay, this is going to be helpful for us to do the next part. Uh, they're asking us how much blue paint we need to make 1,500 uh, millilitres of purple paint. Sorry, I was saying litres before, but it doesn't matter if it's millilitres or litres. So, you know, 1,500 of purple. Okay? So we know that as a fact. So, with ratio, the way ratio works, if we can find the multiplier that takes us from this row, so from this 6 up to 1,500, we can use that same multiplier to find out white paint, blue paint, or red paint. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do to find what we multiply 6 by to get 1,500 is to do the opposite of multiply, which is divide. Okay. So this is the non-calculator paper, so I'm going to do this using the bus stop method. Okay, so first of all, how many times does 6 go into 1? Well, it doesn't. And let's carry the 1, because we haven't used it yet. How many times does 6 go into 15? Well, 6 and 6 is 12, so it goes twice. And from 12, uh, 13, 14, 15, so we've got 3 left over. So now we can say, well, how many times does 6 go into 30? 1, 6 is 6, 2, 6 is 12, 3, 6 is 18, 4, 6 is 24, 5, 6 is 30. So that's 5 exactly, with no remainder. How many times does 6 go into 0? Again, that's 0. So our answer is... 50. So what that means is, to get this we multiply by 250, so we're interested in blue paint, so to find out how much blue paint, again, we multiply by 250, okay? Uh, so I'm going to do 250 times 2, 2 times 0 is 0, 2 times 5 is 10, 0, carry the 1. 2 times 2 is 4, add the 1 is 5. So we can write that here, so we've got it in our table. And how much blue paint does Rhea need? So we could just underline this and say 500 millilitres, making sure that the units we've got here are the same units that we're starting with. And that will get you 3 marks. And on to question two. Here is some information about the number of houses sold by 20 salespeople. And the information is given in the table, which I've copied up here. 
Uh, we've then got work out an estimate for the mean number of houses sold. Okay. Well, first of all, let's try and understand this table that they've given us. Okay. So what this is saying is here the number of houses sold one to five. So there were seven salespeople that sold between one and five houses. Six salespeople sold between six and ten houses. Five salespeople sold between 11 and 15 houses, and two salespeople sold between 16 and 20 houses. We're told there's 20 salespeople, so let's just double check that. Seven plus six is 13, add five is 18, add two gives us 20. So we can make this a total column. Okay. Uh, now we're trying to work out an estimate for the mean. Now, to work out the mean, we need the total of our values divided by the total frequency, or how many there are. Okay? Well, we know the total frequency is going to be 20. Now, to work out the total values, uh, we're not going to be able to do this at the moment because we've got ranges, so we don't know exactly how many houses were sold, whether they could, all seven people could have sold one house, or all seven people could have sold five houses, or they could be spread in between. So what we do in, this, uh, in these types of occasions is we look for a value that's somewhere in the middle, okay? So we can call that the midpoint. So this is going to be, still going to be number of houses sold, but it's going to be the midpoint, okay? Uh, one way of working out the midpoint is to add the numbers together and divide by two, or you can do it a more visual way, write out all of the possible numbers, and then say, well, which one's in the middle? Well, if we eliminate the one and the five, two and the four, we're left with the three. We can do the same, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, so the middle number is eight, eleven, 12, 13, 14, 15, it's going to be 13, and 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Well, again, the middle one is going to be here, which is 18. Okay. Uh, so we've got the midpoint of the number of houses sold. We want the total sold. So there were seven salespeople that sold three houses. Okay, so this is going to be seven times three, which gives us 21. Here we're going to have six times eight, which gives us 48. Here we've got five times 13, So with this one, you might want to do uh, 5 times 10 is 50, 3 times 5 is 15, so 15, 15 is 65. There's other ways you can work it out as well. 2 times 18, well, I'm going to say 2 tens are 20, 2 eights are 16. So if I add 20 and 16 together, I get 36. Now, if I want to get my total values, then that's going to be the sum of these. Okay, so 1 plus 8 is 9, plus 5 is 14, plus 6 is 20. Okay, the 2. 2 and 4 is 6, and another 6 is 12, and 3 is 15, and the 2 is going to be 17. Okay, so our total values are 
70 and our frequency is 20. Well, we can cancel the zeros straight away uh, and we're left with 17 divided by 2 uh, and well I know that 8 times 2 is 16 and 9 times 2 is 18 this is halfway between the two so it's going to be 8 by 5 okay and that seems like a sensible number because if you think well if we just look at the original information we were given, most of the salespeople sold either uh, this, this, or this range. So the middle would feel like it's sort of somewhere in here between six and 10, okay? And so 8.5 looks sensible. The reason that this is saying an estimate for the mean and not an exact answer for the mean is because we're having to use midpoints. So by using midpoints, we're making uh, an assumption that the sales are sort of evenly spread in each of these ranges. And that's three marks. So question three. Amanda wants to buy a new mobile phone. She sees these two offers for the same mobile phone. So for offer A, we've got a two-year contract, monthly cost £59, and mobile phone cost £39.96. Offer B, we've got a SIM only, so you've got the monthly cost of £11, and a mobile phone cost of £889.92. Amanda says, I'll save more than £300 in total over two years with offer B. Use estimation to check if her statement is reasonable. You must show you're working. Okay, so asking us to use estimation, that means we can round these numbers, okay? So if we start with offer A, we've got a two-year contract with a monthly cost of £59. So two years, there's 12 months in a year, so two years it's going to be 24 months. And a monthly cost of £59, so we can round that. To 60 okay and then we're going to have a mobile phone cost of 39 pounds 96 so we can round that to 40 pounds okay and now let's start off of B and then we can do our calculations afterwards so for off of B we've got the sim only monthly cost of 11 pounds again it's going to be for 24 months so we can say 24 times, well, 11 pounds, let's round that to 10 pounds. And then we've got the mobile phone cost of 889 pounds 92. Let's round that to 900 pounds. Now, with the rounding for estimating, uh, it is something that you just need to get a little bit used to, knowing what's reasonable. When should I round the nearest 10? When should I round the nearest 100? 100. Uh, with these, if we're going to be multiplying something by £24, then you probably don't want to be rounding more than one or two pounds. But with the 889, because it's a fixed amount, we're not going to be multiplying it by anything, then rounding that to 900 seems reasonable. Okay, so now to work each of these out. 24 times 60. 4 times 0 is 0. And 2 times 0 zero fine so now we're going to use our six four times six is twenty four over two two six is a twelve and the other two is fourteen okay so we've got one thousand four hundred and forty pounds then we want to add on the forty so if we add the forty Total. Well, we can add it onto the 10, so we're going to have 1,480. And that's our total for offer A. On offer B, 
24 times 10, so we multiply by 10, I can just add a zero to that. So we're going to have 240, and then we're going to add 900. So zero and zero is still zero. Four plus zero is four. Two plus nine, well that's 11. Okay. Now, Amanda says I'll save more than 300 pounds in total. So let's see how much she saves. So to find the difference, we need to take the larger number and subtract the smaller. So zero take away zero, zero. Eight take away zero is four. Four take away one is three. One take away one is zero. So I don't need to write the zero. 340 pounds. Uh, well, that is more than 300, so I think we can say, yes, Amanda's statement is reasonable. And question four. Matt buys a new fish tank. The fish tank is in the shape of a cuboid. The diagram shows water in the tank. So I've drawn the diagram up here for us. I've used a bit of colour. Hopefully that, uh, that doesn't make it more difficult for you to see. So we've got a full cuboid, but it's not all full of water. Matt knows 1,000 centimetres cubed is equal to one metre. One gallon is equal to 4.5 metres. He can keep two small fish in the tank for every one gallon of water in the tank. Matt thinks he can keep more than 36 small fish in the tank. Is Matt correct? Okay, so with this type of question, especially it's a six mark question, so there's quite a bit we've got to do here. It's good to think through all of the steps before you start. Okay, so first of all, we're going to need to work out how much water we've got in there. Okay, now we've got that in centimetres, so we're going to work out the volume in centimetres cubed. We can then convert that into litres, uh, then convert it into gallons, and then when we've got the amount in gallons, we can use this information about two small fish for every one gallon of water to work out how many fish we can get in there. Okay, so the so first thing we're going to do is work out the volume. So volume is equal to the height times width. By depth, I mean the depth of the cuboid. So the height we've got 30, the width we've got 100, and the depth, make it clear that's 100, we've got another 30. Okay, uh, this is the non calculator paper, so it does make a difference. Uh, or it can make a difference, which order you multiply the numbers in terms of making it easier for yourself. Uh, what I find the easiest is to just ignore the zeros. So 3 times 1 is 3, times another 3 is 9. And then we can put the zeros back on. So 1 zero here, 2 zeros there, and another zero there. So we've now got 90,000 centimetres cubed. Okay, so we've got our volume. The next thing we said we wanted to do is we wanted to convert it from centimetres cubed into litres. Okay, so to do that we need to do 90,000, well, if a thousand centimetres are one litre, then we need to divide this by 1,000. 
to get the number of litres. We're dividing by a thousand, we've got three zeros, so if we move our decimal point, which would be here, one, two, three. So that's going to be equal to 90 litres. Okay. So we've worked out the volume as centimetres cubed, we've then converted it to litres. Now we want to convert our litres into gallons. Okay. Well, one gallon is 4.5 litres. Okay. Uh, we want to know how many gallons. So if we know how many 4.5s go into here, then we'll know how many gallons we've got. So we're saying 90 divided by 4.5. Okay. Uh, it might look a bit strange at first, but again, there's different ways of doing it. But if you ignore the decimal point, 1945, ah, you might think, well, 90 is 2 times 45. Uh, otherwise, you could try dividing it with the bus stop method. Uh, or we could say, well, if we're doing it with the bus stop method, we've got 4.5 into 90. Okay, well, 4.5, four and a half, well, that's going to go into 9 exactly twice. Because two fours are 8, and 2 times a half is 1. So 8 and 1 gives 9. And then 4.5 into 0, well, that's not going to go at all. So that's going to give us 20 gallons. Now, you can keep two small fish for every one gallon. So if we've got 20 gallons, so for, if we've got a little heading here, Number of fish, that's going to be 2 times the number of gallons, 2 times 20, well let's write it as a column, 2 times 0 is 0, 2 times 2 is 4, so 40 fish. He thinks he can keep more than 36, well, 40, that is more than 36 fish. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So it might look quite a lot, but we've got six marks for it. So we're probably getting one mark for working out the volume in centimetres cubed, a second mark for converting it to litres, a third mark for turning it into gallons. Uh, what have we got then? Probably a fourth mark for getting our number of fish. A fifth mark for comparing it to the 36. And then a sixth mark for giving the answer overall and whether I've allowed for all six points or not. Certainly having consistent and correct units is going to make sure you can get all of the marks available. And this is question one of the calculator part of the paper. Data set A has a median value of 3.1. Here is data set B. Part A. Write a statement to compare the median values of the two sets of data. Okay, well if I'm going to write a statement to compare the median values, I need to know what they both are. They've told me the uh, median for data set A is 3.1, so I'm going to work it out for data set B. So when you've got the median to work out, you need to remember that median is the middle value. Okay. Now, to find the middle value, you need to have the values in order. So, let's list them out with the smallest first. So that's going to be minus 38. And then we've got 
minus 13, minus 9, minus 2, 14, and 28. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. When you measure data. It's always good to write them out. And as I say, as I just did, to count them here and count them on the sheet. So you can make sure you haven't missed any out. Now, the median is going to be the middle value. So if we cross off the first and the last, this and this one, we're actually left with two values. So if you've got two for the median, then what you need to do is to add them together. So minus nine plus minus two, and then divide that by two. Now, when we've got a plus and a minus together, the minus is going to win. So this is just minus nine, minus two, which is going to give us minus 11, divided by two. Okay. Uh, this is a calculator paper, so you can use a calculator for this, and you'll find that this gives you an answer of minus 5.5. Okay, so now to write our statement. Uh, well, for data set A, the median was 3.1. For data set B, the median is minus 5.5. So I can just say the median for data set B is less, well, it's negative, so it's less than that. Or data set A. You don't need to be drawing any uh, wonderful conclusions, they just want something that shows you can compare the two numbers. So one is less than, than the other is absolutely fine. Then for part B, we're asked to show a check of your answer for the median of data set B. Okay, so the best thing we can do to check this is to do a reverse of the calculations. So if we do minus 5.5 times 2, well, I'm going to do it in my head, but again, you can do it on a calculator. This is going to give me minus 11, and we can say uh, this is the same as minus 9 plus minus 2 minus 11. Okay, so two marks for part A, one mark for part B. And question 2. Dan throws two fair dice. The numbers on dice A are 1 minus 2, 3 minus 4, 5 and minus 6. The numbers on dice B are minus 1, 2, minus 3, 4, minus 5, and 6. The table shows some total scores from throwing the two dice. Okay, and this is a table that we've got up there. Now, for part A, they ask us to complete the table. Okay, uh, it's always good with something like this to check you understand how they've got the answers that are already there. So they say that these are the total scores. So if we start in this one, then what we're saying is that minus one plus one is zero, which makes sense. Uh, minus one plus minus two, well, that's going to make it more negative by two on the number line. So that gives us minus three, okay? And if I pick one where they're both positive, two plus five is seven. Okay, so I think I'm understanding how they're getting the numbers. So now I can start to fill in the blanks. So minus 1 plus 5, or you can think of it as 5 minus 1, and that's going to be 4. Okay. Uh, let's start with the bigger numbers. Minus 6 plus 2, well that's going to make it 2 less negative. So that's going to be minus 4. Minus 3 plus 3, that's going to be 0. Uh, 
2 plus minus 2, or minus 2 plus 2, that's going to be 0. 5 minus 3 is going to be 2. Minus 6 minus 3 is going to be minus 9. Obviously you can do these with your calculator, you're allowed to. Um, if you're, if you're not comfortable doing it in your head, that's absolutely fine. 4 plus 3 is 7. 4 plus 5 is 9. 4 minus 6, that's going to be minus 2. Minus 5 minus 2, that's going to give me minus 7. Minus 5 minus 4, that's going to give me minus 9. 6 and 1 is 7. 6 minus 2 is 4. 6 plus 5 is 11. Okay, so that's completing the table. So that's only one mark for part A, but then it should help us answer the next part of the question quite quickly. So for part B, it says Dan throws the two dice once. What is the probability that the total score is minus 11? Okay, well, if we think, how many different outcomes have we got? Well, we've got 6, 6, 6. In fact, we've got 6 times 6 outcomes. So, 6 times 6 is 36. So, the probability is we're going to have 36 as the denominator. And the probability that the total score is minus 11. So, how many times do we get minus 11? Uh, well, there's only one way that we can get it. So it's going to be 1, that is 36. And for part C, Dan throws the two dice again. What's the probability that the new total score is 0? Well, again, it's going to be out of 36, because there's 36 possible outcomes. And we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, where there's 0. 6 out of 36. Now, I know my 6 times table, so I know that 6 goes into 6 once, and 6 goes into 36 6 times, so I'm going to simplify that one there as well. And that's 3 marks in total. And question 3. Last year, Zach had two jobs. Zach worked in an office for 12 months and earned £2,600 per month, at a gym for 39 weekends and earned £80 per weekend. What fraction of his total income last year came from his work at the gym? Write the fraction in its simplest form. Okay, so we're going to need to work out how much he earned at the gym, but we're also going to need to work out how much he earned in total so we can then express that as a fraction. So if we start off with the office. Now, he earned for 12 months, he earned 2,600. I'm going to use my calculator for this one. So 12 times 2,600 gives us 31,200. Okay. And at the gym, he was working weekends. He worked 39 of those and got paid £80 each time. So £39 80 gives us £3,120. Okay. So the total. Would be thirty one thousand two hundred plus three thousand one hundred and twenty. It gives us thirty four thousand three hundred and twenty. So they want the what fraction of his total income? So that means the total income is going to be the denominator. Uh, came from his work at the gym, so that's going to be 3,120 on top, okay? 
but they want this in its simplest form. So there's different ways you can try and see what numbers are going to go in both of these. We've got a zero at the end of both, so the first thing I'm going to do is cancel those. Now, uh, this is a, a nice little trick. If you add up the digits here, 3 plus 1 plus 2, that gives you 6. Uh, that tells me that this number is divisible by 3. If we add up the numbers here, 3 plus 4 plus 3 is 10, and 2 is 12. Then add those digits together, 1 and 2 is 3, so I know this number is divisible by 3. Now, if you didn't use my little trick, you could just pick numbers anyway. They're both even, so you could divide by 2, but I'm going to divide them both by 3. So if we divide 312 by 3, we get 104. And if we divide 3432 by 3, we get 1144. Okay, so now I'm going to, they're both even, so I'll divide them by 2. I know that the top is going to go down to 52. And the bottom goes to 572. Again, you might be able to recognise uh, other numbers you can divide them both by, so common factors, or we can just do the same. Half of 52 is 26, and half of 572 is 286. Let's divide that by 2 again. Half of 26 is 13. Half of 286 is 143. Okay, now you might think, oh, I'm getting a little bit stuck. Well, I know that the only factors, well, 13 is a prime number. So the only factors of 13 are 1 and 13 itself. Uh, 1 isn't going to help us simplify this any further. So I'm going to see, does 13 go into 143? And it does. In fact, it goes in 11 times. So that is the fraction that they asked for uh, in its simplest form. And that will get you four marks. Question four. Here is a prism. And I've drawn this for us. The cross section of the prism is a pentagon. So we're talking about this bit here, which has been labelled the front. Okay, so you can imagine if this continued going on forever, wherever you cut it, the cross section would look like that. Draw the front elevation of the prism on the grid. So the grid they've got here, I've drawn it down here. Use the scale one to three. So on here, it's one centimetre. So if we go like this, one centimetre. So that means that one centimetre on here will be three centimetres for my prism. Okay? And I want you to draw the front elevation. So before I draw it on here, I'm going to draw a little sketch. So the front elevation. that pretty much, where this is 15 centimetres, across the top is going to be 10.5 centimetres, along the bottom we've got 18 centimetres, and this bit at the bottom here is 4.5 centimetres. Now, we haven't got this length, we don't need to know this length because we can just, if we've drawn the other lines, we can then just connect that using a ruler. Okay, now I've drawn this once. Uh, I'm going to draw the same thing uh, a bit more carefully. So I'm going to draw it again. Doesn't matter if it's not exactly the same, it's for a sketch. And what I'm going to do on here is write how many squares I'm going to need. So if I grab my calculator, 
So, I'll show you what I mean. So, we're told that one centimetre on here means three centimetres on our picture. So, 15 divided by three is going to mean five squares. I don't need my calculator for that one. Along here, if I do 10, Point five and divide that by three, we should get that this is three point five squares. Along the bottom, eighteen divided by three. Well, I know that's going to be six squares. And four point five divided by three. That should give me 1.5. Okay, so now I just need to draw that on here. If I take my ruler, so it doesn't matter where I draw it as long as I've got enough space. So I'm thinking if I start in this corner here, we need six squares along the bottom. One, two, three, four, five, six. They're one and a half squares up, so that's going to be to there. And going this way, one, two, three, four, five up, and three and a half, one, two, three, and a half there. Okay, so now I can join these all up with my ruler. Always use a ruler for any of these diagrams or graphs in the exam. It's going to make it look so much better, especially if you're potentially a bit nervous and anxious in the exam. You don't want wonky lines and potentially losing marks. Okay. And there is my drawing of the front elevation of the prism for three marks. Okay, on to question five. Olga has this sketch of the paths in a park, and I've drawn it out for us here. She wants a cycle route that starts and ends at the entrance. Here's the entrance goes through point C at least once, point C here, has a total length between 15 kilometres and 20 kilometres. Uh, one kilometre is equal to 0 0.6 miles, and they ask us to plan a suitable route and work out the total distance of the route. Okay, uh, the thing that I noticed straight away is the total length needs to be between 15 kilometres and 20 kilometres. But all the measurements we've got in here are in miles. Okay, so we want to convert. We could convert everything to kilometres, but then we've got a lot of distances we'd have to convert. Instead, what we can do is if we take our 15 kilometres to 20 kilometres, we can convert those into miles instead. So we're told that one kilometre equals 0 0.6 miles. So that means that 15 kilometres will be 0 0.6 times 15. I can use my calculator for this, or you can work it out in your head. That is fine. And that should give us nine miles. Okay. We're then going to do the same with 20 kilometers. So 0 0.6 times 20. And this gives us So I'm going to write that underneath. So this is nine miles. To twelve miles. Okay. 
Right, so now I don't need to worry about kilometres anymore. I'm going to do everything in miles. Right. If I'm going to work out a route, I can start to just sort of have a go and work it out. I like to write it down and plan it in a table. That way I can see as I'm going whether I need to do, whether I'm doing too much or if I need to add on a little section somewhere. So I'm going to draw a little table. Let's draw it here. And I'm going to give my columns as start and distance and cumulative distance. So basically we're just going to add up the distance as we're going along. I find it really helpful to do a table like this. So we're going to start at the entrance. And we need the distance to be between 9 miles and 12 miles. We also need to go through C at least once. And we need to start and finish at the entrance. So I'm thinking initially, what about doing a lap? So let's start here get round to C and then see whether we can continue or if we have to add some extra bits in somewhere. So we're going to start at the entrance and we're going to go to D. So that distance is one and three quarters. So at the moment, the cumulative distance will be the same. Then we're going to go from D to C. And that's two and a quarter miles. So cumulatively, you can use your calculator or you can say three quarters plus a quarter makes one whole. And then another one is two, and another two makes it four miles. Okay. Uh, maybe if I put in here that this is in miles. So we've got to C. Now let's go from C to B. And that is four and a quarter miles. So we want to add four and a quarter miles onto the four we've already travelled. So four and four is eight. And we've still got that quarter there. So it's taken us eight and a quarter miles to get here. So I'm just going to have a quick look. If we were to finish, we've got half a mile, a quarter, and another quarter. Uh, well, a quarter and a quarter is half, and another half is a whole. Okay, so it looks like if we finish our circuit, we should be between 9 miles and 12 miles. But let's let's write it all out to make sure. So, we've got to be, so if we do B to A, which is half a mile, there's that, well, a quarter plus a half is going to take us up to eight and three quarters. Then from A, we're going to go to F, which is a quarter of a mile. That's going to take us up to nine miles in total. Go to the bottom of my table here. And from F, we're going to go back to the entrance. And that's another a quarter of a mile. So that's going to make the route nine and a quarter miles. Okay, so we've planned our route. We've made sure that it starts and ends at the entrance. It goes through point C and it has a total length between 15 kilometers and 20 kilometers. There you go, and that's for five marks. Question six. Here is a cube of side length 2.5 centimeters. And I've drawn it out here for us. Work out the surface area of this cube. Okay, so the surface area. 
So that's saying for each of the sides, what's the area? And add them all together. So it's a cube. So that means that all of the sides are going to have the same area. So the front, the back, the left side, the right side, the top, and the base. Okay, so that means I'm going to have six identical faces. Okay, so if I can work out the area of one of them, I can just multiply that by six. Okay, so the area of this front, well, it's a cube, so that means this length is the same as this length. So we can do 2.5 times 2.5. And then, as I said, we want six of them, so we can multiply that by six. And we can do this all in one go on our calculator. So, 2.5. and that's going to be centimetres squared. Okay, uh, Even though we're multiplying three things together, we're working out the area of one face and then multiplying that by six. So it's still area, so it still needs to be squared. And that's three marks. Question seven. Megan is the manager of a computer shop. She organises a sale with 18% off all tablets. Megan changes the price of one tablet from £389 to £330.98. Has Megan changed the price correctly? Okay. Well, the best way to do this is to uh, take 18% off the price and see if we get the same answer that she got. Okay. Now, with this one, you can do it in two ways. You can work out 18% of 389 and then take that away. I'm going to do it uh, a slightly more efficient way. I'm going to say if we want 18% off, that's the same as 82%. In other words, 100 minus 18 of the original price. Okay. So that means that I can write 82% as a decimal, which is 0 0.82, multiply that by 389. Now I can use my calculator for this. And that gives me £318.98. Uh, has Megan changed the price correctly? Well, this is not equal to £330.98. So, no, Megan has not changed the price correctly. Okay, that's three marks for part A. Now, in part B, they've asked us to use estimation to show a check of your answer. Okay, uh, so what we can do with this one. With estimation, really we're looking at rounding numbers so that we can do sort of quick calculations. So instead of saying 18% off, let's say that it's 20% off. Okay, and instead of £389, we're going to say £390. Then I can quickly say, well, 10% would 
be £39, because I'm just taking them to zero. So 20% would be double that, £78. If I do 390 minus 78, I get zero, take away eight, I can't do. So reduce the nine to an eight. And give the one over there. 10 minus 8 is 2. 8 minus 7 is 1. 3 minus nothing is 3. So we end up with 312. And I can say, no, uh, looks too far away. from 330 pounds 98. So even with my check, I'm saying, no, I don't agree with that. And that's your check using estimation. Question eight. The team of workers deliver identical fridges. The team will use the average time to fully load an old lorry, to predict the time to fully load a new lorry. The table shows the times it took to fully load the old lorry with 24 fridges. The diagram shows the space available for fridges in the new lorry. The space is in the shape of a cuboid. And uh, it's given here for us. Each fridge needs a rectangular floor space of 1000 millimetres by 800 millimetres. The team do not stack fridges. They think it will take less than 90 minutes to fully load the new lorry. Are they correct? Okay, well they say they're going to use uh, the average time to fully load the old lorry. So I'm going to work out my average. Now it hasn't said what average to use. Uh, I'm going to work out the mean. So I'm going to add these together. And then I'm going to divide these by the number I've got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. So if I use my calculator to add these up with 32 plus 60 and 60 plus 55 plus 59 plus 54 plus 63 plus 56 and that gives us 399 divided by 7 which is 57 and that should be minutes okay so now we want to think about how many fridges we can fit in this space. Okay. Uh, they've shown a cuboid, but really we're not stacking these, so the height isn't really important to us. So I'm going to think of this as just the area of the base. So I'm going to draw the base for us. Now this isn't a scale. One, three, six, eight, eight millimeters along that way, and we've got two thousand four hundred millimeters that way. Now, one of our fridges is going to be something like this, and it's a thousand millimeters that way by 800 that way. So I want to try and work out how can you best fit these in the new lorry. Well, the 8 and the 24 are kind of uh, grabbing my attention because I'm thinking, well, if I didn't have the two zeros at the end, or three eights, 
a 24. So that means that I can fit three of these fridges in this way. Okay. And if I want to work out how many I can fit in this way, well then I need to take 13,600 uh, 13, and divide that by thousand. Well, leave my decimal point three places. One, two, three, because I've got three zeros. So that's going to give us 13.6. So I can get three fridges this way, 13.6 this way. Obviously, 0.6 of a fridge is no good to us. So the number Fridges will have to be three down this way times thirteen, and you can use your calculator, or you can trust me. Three times thirteen is thirty-nine. Okay, so we now can fit thirty-nine fridges in. Uh, if it took fifty-seven, so fifty-seven minutes. And that was for 24 fridges, okay? Now, if we've got 39 fridges, then we're going to need 39 divided by 24 times 57. So we're doing a bit of, uh, bit of ratio here. 39 divided by 24, multiplied by 57, and that gives us 92.625 minutes. And they're asking, they think it will take less than 90 minutes. Well, no, this is more than 90 minutes. So, no, they are incorrect. Six marks. Question nine. Louis makes a cake. The cake is in the shape of a cylinder with diameter 14 inches. Um, I've drawn that for us up here. Louis needs to put a ribbon around the cake. The ribbon will go around the cake once with a six inch overlap. Louis has a piece of ribbon 48 inches in length. Is this piece of ribbon long enough for this cake? Okay, well, we've got our cake here and we're told it's a cylinder. That means that the top is in the shape of a circle. So you can draw that for us. So although a cylinder is a 3D shape, we're just interested in something going around the outside. So actually this is more about a 2D shape, it's more about a circle than actually a cylinder. Okay, we're told the diameter is 14 inches, so it's shown there. And just to remind you, the diameter is the line that goes from one side to the other, passing through the centre. So we know that this is 14 inches. Okay. And we need the ribbon to go around the cake, so all the way around is the circumference. And he needs a six inch overlap. So if you can imagine, you want the ribbon to stick, so you make it a little bit longer to make sure that it's, it's going to stay on the cake. Okay, so what we need to work out is the circumference, and then we can add an extra six inches on to find out how long this ribbon needs to be. Okay, so the formula for the circumference. Is, and you can remember this in uh, two different ways. You can remember it as two 
pi r, so 2 times pi times the radius, or you can remember it as pi d, which is pi times the diameter. And because we're already given the diameter, we're better to use this one. Okay? So uh, they don't tell us in this question, but for pi, we can either use the pi button on our calculator, if it's got one, or we can use it, pi is equal, equal to 3.14. Okay? And we know that in this case, d is equal to 14. Okay? So, pi d, and when we're dealing with a formula like this, if we have two symbols together, or a number and a symbol, this means pi times the diameter. So if I grab my calculator here, 3.14 times 14, and we get 43.96, and that's going to be inches. If you've got the pi button on your calculator, then you'll get a number slightly bigger than that. But for this question, it, it, it's fine. If you've got a pi button, use it. If not, use 3.14. Okay, so that's the circumference. Then we need to add on the six inch overlap. Okay, so to make the addition easier, let's put some zeros in. So six plus zero is six, nine plus zero is nine, this one point, but 3 plus 6 is 9, and there we get 49.96 inches. That is how long we need the ribbon to be. Now, Louis has a piece of ribbon 48 inches in length, so we can say, well, this is more than 48 inches, so... No, the ribbon is not long enough. And all of that for three marks. Question 10. The scatter diagram shows some information about 12 athletes who have run a race. And we've got the scatter diagram here. Here is the information for another athlete. Age 36, time 29 minutes. Part A, plot this information on the scatter diagram. Okay, age 36. Well, between age 30 and 40, we've got five squares. So that means that we must be going up uh, in two-year blocks so we'd have 32, 34, 36. Okay, so we want to follow this line up until we get to 29. Now, for time, it looks like we're going up one square for each minute. So that's not so much of a problem. So 36 is this line, and 29 is going to be right there. Okay. So we've got our point drawn. Now part B, draw the line of best fit on the scatter diagram. Okay, so we need a ruler for this. And we want a line that goes through the data. Uh, it doesn't have to go through any of the points, but it doesn't matter if it does. But we want it to have roughly an even number of points above the line as below the line. So first I'd like to think, well, what's the overall sort of pattern sort of where is it going and it's the line is going going up this way really so I've got my ruler going up and now I want to have it somewhere in between so I'm thinking something probably like this and I need to make sure that the line goes to at least slightly beyond the point at the bottom and the same at the top. And that looks reasonable to me. Describe the relationship shown 
in this scatter diagram. So I'd say uh, a positive correlation. So positive because the line's going up. So as the age increases, time increases, a positive correlation between age and time. And that should get you your three marks. Question 11. George will cover part of the floor with tiles. The part of the floor is in the shape of a triangle as shown. And I've drawn that for us up here. George buys tiles in packs. Each pack covers one metre squared and costs £39.95. The tiles can be cut and joined. George gets one third off the cost of the packs of tiles. Work out the lowest cost of the tiles for George. Okay, so what we're going to need to do is work out the area of this part of the floor. See how many packs we need, knowing that each pack covers one metre squared. And then work out the cost of that with £39.95 being uh, one full pack. And then we can take one third of the price. Okay. Now, to start with, before we do anything, each pack covers one metre squared. So they're talking about metres. At the moment, we've got centimetres, okay? Now I know that one metre is 100 centimetres. So I'm going to convert these to metres straight away. It's much easier for, uh, for when we're going to use our, our formula for the area of a triangle. So in all cases, especially area, I'd always say, if you're going to do a conversion, do it at the start of the question, and it'll make your life easier. So if one metre is 100 centimetres, with 305 centimetres, we need to divide that by 100. So we're moving our decimal point from at the end, in one, in two. So this is going to be 3.05 metres. And the same here, move the decimal point twice, and we've got 3.715 metres. Now the area of a triangle is a half of the height times the base. In metres, it's 3.05. And our base in metres is 3.715. So if we use my calculator, 3.05 times 3.715. And I get my answer. I want a half of that so I can divide that by 2. And that gives me. 5.67, uh, that's going to be metres squared. You don't need to write this, but I'm going to add for that to two decimal places. So I've rounded that. Now for us, that isn't really important because we know that each pack covers one metre squared. Okay, so if we need 5.67 metres, well, we're going to need six packs because you can't buy part of a pack so we're going to need a full six packs okay now well, uh, this third off the price we could take a third off of the 39.95 and then multiply it or we can multiply six by the full 39.95 and take it off at the end it doesn't matter, as long as you do it correctly, either way will work. So, I'm going to multiply the 6 by 
which gives me 239.70. George gets a third off. So I could work out a third and take it away, or I can think, well, if a third is coming off the price, that means I'm going to be left with two thirds of that amount. And then I can do it in one step. So I've still got 239.7 in my calculator, so I'm going to multiply that by 2, divide it by 3 for the 2 thirds, and I get £159. Says so 0.8 on my calculator, but we want that in pounds and pence. So I add the zero, and that's the lowest cost of the tiles for George, for five marks. Question 12. Gabby wants to buy a flat. The cost of the flat is £175,000. The bank uses this formula to work out the mortgage Gabby can get. Now, I've written the formula here. So M equals 4.625A, where M is the mortgage and A here is the annual income. Gabby has an annual income of £34,000. She will have to pay a deposit for the flat. The deposit is the difference between the cost of the flat and the mortgage. Work out the deposit Gabby will have to pay. Okay, so first of all, let's work out what the mortgage is going to be. Okay, so I'll write it under here. M equals 4.625A. Well, that's going to be 4.625 multiplied by the annual income, which is 34,000. And if it's my calculator, that's going to give me 4.625 times 34,157,250. The deposit is the difference between the cost of the flat and the mortgage. Okay, well, the cost of the flat is 175,000 and the mortgage is 157,250. Obviously, you can do this all on your calculator, but I'm just going to do a little bit of a revision on doing uh, subtraction in a column like this. So, zero take away zero, zero, zero take away five. Well, we can't do that. We need one from here. But we've got zero, we haven't got any to spare. So we'll go to the five. Reduce that to a four and pass one over here. We still want one over here, so we can reduce the 10 to a nine. And now we've got 10, take away five, which is five. Nine, take away two, which is seven. Four, take away seven, we can't do. So it reduces to a 6, get an extra 1 here. 14 take away 7 is 7. 6 take away 5 is 1. 1 take away 1 is 0. So we've got 17,750 pounds. And this is our deposit. Okay. Now there's also a part B to this question. Turn this over. Gabby invests £4,000 for three years. The investment earns 2% compound interest per annum. Work out the value of the interest at the end of three years. Okay. Now, you can do this uh, in one go and you can say I've got £4,000 and I'm going to multiply that by 1.02, where 1 represents the initial amount, 2 represents the 2%, 0 
and because it's three years, we want to cube that. Okay, and if we do this on our calculator, so cubed means that you multiply the number by itself three times. So 1.02 times 1.02 times 1.02. Then multiply that all by 4,000. And you get 4,244 pounds 83. Okay. Now, you might not be as comfortable uh, writing it all in one go. That's absolutely fine. Instead, you can think, well, they're going to get 2% each year over three years. So that's like saying, let's do four. So that's like saying, well, £4,000 in year one. That's going to be £4,000 times 1.02. So this would be the same as working out 2% of this and then adding that 2% on the original 4,000. So if I do 4,000 times 1.02, I get 4,080. So 80 pounds is 2% of this. Okay, that's year one. In year two, I've now got 4,080 pounds. And all of that is going to get 2%. So it's not just the initial 4,000. All We're now getting interest on the interest. So if I now multiply 4,080 by 1.02, we get 4,161.60. Now for year three, we're going to take all of that £4,161.60 and apply 2% interest to that and we get £4,244.83. So we can either do it this way or in one go or this way and either way gets you three marks. As I say, if you wanted to, you could even work out 2% of this and then add it on, get your answer. Then work out 2% of this, add it on, get your answer. It's the same as this method, but it would just take you a little bit longer. But if that means that you're more comfortable uh, and more confident with your answer, that's absolutely fine. And that's the end of the paper.